Our scripture this morning is found in Jeremiah chapter 18. Obviously, we're going to be uh, covering the entire chapter, but we're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 12. Then we're going to look at what Paul had to say uh, that echoes what Jeremiah is saying in a couple of hours. Y'all think I'm kidding. Angie brought a whole stack of blankets to church with her this morning. No, I'm kidding. We're going to read Jeremiah chapter 1, or chapter 1. We're going to read uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. In the honor of the reading of God's word, let's all stand. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. So now then speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. Oh, turn back, each of you, from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds." But they will say it's hopeless, for we are going to follow our own plans, and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this morning. And we ask, O God, as you illumine the heart and mind of Jeremiah when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word, that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning as well, and that you would cause us to allow you to mold us into the masterpiece that you want us to be. Father God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart, and we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. And it's through the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Master. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, I didn't really focus in on this when... And verse 11, put verse 11 up there for me real quick, please. But, you know, uh, one of the things, when, when we were at the Trunk or Treat event uh, Thursday night, uh, Brother Jay from Fairview was just kind of a catty corner for me and, and his van with his wife. And, 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 and as theologues uh, love to do, we, we talked theology for a little while and, you know, just uh, all of that. And as I got ready to leave, it being October the 31st, uh, I, I looked at him, and I did not wish him Happy Halloween. I wished him Happy Reformation Day. Because October the 31st is the date on which Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church at uh, Wittenberg that eventually ended up in us being here today. And listen, beloved, Luther's goal when he nailed those theses on the door at at Wittenberg, was not to begin Lutheranism. Luther's goal was to get the Catholic Church to reform from the very things that we're reading about in Jeremiah uh, this morning. That they had chosen to go their own way and that the Word of God meant little or, or, or nothing to them. Now, this sermon is not a Catholic bashing sermon. But it is for all of those that will choose to say that the Word of God really doesn't have any bearing on how we're going to live our lives. For those that that find themselves in verse 12 saying, it's hopeless, we're going to follow our own plans. You know, there was a time in my life when the Bible 
you know, was at the center of why we went to church. We study it in Sunday school. And some of the churches I grew up in, the pastor would actually preach from the Bible. He would actually preach from the Bible. And some of the other churches, he would read a verse, close his Bible, and then preach his sermon, and you're going, I'm struggling to understand what that verse that he read had to do with what he preached on. And you notice that as I finish reading the Word of God in our presence, I always say that as you illumined the human author, when you gave to them this perfect and infallible Word. Beloved, if the Word of God is not perfect and infallible, we are absolutely wasting our time and our energy here this morning. That's not the opinion of Larry. That's the opinion of Scripture. If it is not perfect and infallible, you find me one error in this book and the whole thing goes out the the window. You know, I know it will surprise you all. At work, I've got kind of a reputation for being harsh. And I have a document that explains how I expect a vendor to come in and install network cabling in my network. Because for those of you that don't know, it takes a lot of wires to make something wireless. Okay? It does. And so I have this very specific document that says how I want those wires installed in my network. And it specifically states in that document, I expect you to label every cable where it goes, and I expect you to test every drop that you installed to make sure it's correct. And then it says, if I find one mislabeled cable or one dead drop, you will come back and relabel or retest every single drop that I just had you install. Okay? Okay? The point that I'm making is that I expect my vendors to be 100% accurate in what they're doing. God gave to us His Word, and it is 100% accurate. Listen, I have listened to all the arguments that try to rip apart the Bible and say that it was oral, and, or that you know, it was handed down, or it's the opinion of man. Listen to me, beloved, if that book is the opinion of man, then why in the world are we reading it? Because what makes those guys' opinion uh, any better than my opinion? Or your opinion? Or our dog's opinion? If the Word of God is not exactly what it claims to be, then there's no point. And again, Paul makes that point repeatedly throughout his epistles. In Psalm 9, verse 17, it says, The wicked will return to Sheol, even all of the nations who forget God. Let me read that to you and kind of surprise you. Okay? Because some of y'all think that I don't like the King James. I do. All right? I just prefer to preach from a version that removes some barriers, some linguistic barriers. In the King James, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Judah in Jeremiah's day was a nation that was on its way to hell. Again, not my opinion. That's what God has been saying throughout Jeremiah's prophecy up to this point. And it was not a new message. Jeremiah prophesied to the nation of Judah for over 40 years. And his message was consistent. He told them over and over again that unless they reformed, verse 11, that they were going to find themselves in a place that they never thought God would send them. 
I have a book in my library. I think I, I gave it away to somebody years ago, but uh, I, I may have given it away to some young preacher boy that I was uh, ministering to. But it was a book by Charles Stanley. And the title of that book was Confronting Casual Christianity. <laughs> How many at the ball game last night, which, by the way, I... I was gone by halftime, I'll be honest with you. Uh, Angie even tried to wake me up when it started getting good, and I'm like, nah. How many of us would think it odd to find somebody sitting down in Neyland Stadium asleep during a football game? Or how many, you know, we know that, that teams, when they come into Neyland Stadium, that they specifically practice to deal with all of the noise that's going to be inside that stadium. I was quiet for a moment to make a point. What if it was as quiet last night at Neyland Stadium as it is in here right now? What if when Tennessee scored a touchdown, everybody just kind of went... And there was no noise in the stadium at all. See, beloved, God calls us to be all in. We ought to be more excited about the fact that God wants to make us into a masterpiece. You know, there are several good Christian songs. Johnny Diaz or Diaz has a great one. Mercy Me has a great one that speaks to our young people when, when they're at that age where they're struggling with how they fit in. You know what I'm saying? I see their searches, beloved. I see what they're looking for. And it breaks my heart because I see the search and I just want to get up and drive over to the school and say, you do not have to think this way. God says you're a masterpiece. I don't care what your weight is. I don't care whether you wear glasses or you don't wear glasses. I don't care whether you got nice, cool hair or your hair's like mine and you can't do anything with it. That's why I wear my hair so short. Okay? I don't care about any of those things. What I care about is how God sees you. And what I want you all to hear this morning is... God sees you as a masterpiece. We'll go through the text in, in just a few moments. God's already changed the direction. I, you can ask Brian. God's already changed the direction that I was going to go with this sermon, and He's changing it again right now. Or maybe He's just bringing me further in line with what He wanted to do because He knew that, that if He changed the whole direction all at once, I'd go, do what? So many times, and, and again, it's one of those things I, I teach young preacher boys when I minister to them, is I say, you know, listen, I do believe that a pastor needs to go into the pulpit with notes. Okay? You need to have notes to keep yourself on track. But you also need to be prepared for the Holy Spirit as you're reading your text to say, that was so cute of you to bring that piece of paper with you this morning. <laughs> okay? Now, you just leave that alone and you preach what I want you to preach, all right? <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make, beloved, is that God had been working. I mean, we've been seeing in the 17 chapters that are leading up to this that God has been getting increasingly intense with the people of Judah. And for those of you that have ever tried to share your faith with somebody, especially somebody that has read all of those lists on the Internet about how the Bible is all wrong, or about how, you know, in the Old Testament God is mad, and in the New Testament God is love, that's not what the Bible is showing us at all. What God has been saying through the 17 chapters leading up to this is that judgment is coming. And what chapter 18 is showing us is the love that is behind that judgment. God doesn't want that judgment to come. I said God doesn't want that judgment to come into the lives of those people. 
Peter tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In chapter 17, we saw Jeremiah was taught two great truths. And that is, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. The point there, there is no hope in humanity. I mean, I've told you the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism so many times. Calvinism begins at the point uh, of total depravity. That we are completely depraved and the only way we're ever going to get better is if God comes into our life and redeems us. Arminianism begins with the point humanity is basically pretty good. And Jesus comes in and he puts a band-aid on the boo-boo and makes you better. You can see why I reject that worldview. Number one, it has zero scriptural support. The Bible thoroughly tells us that there is no hope in humanity. That the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. But then Jeremiah was also shown a glorious throne set on high from the beginning. That is, there is hope in God and in God only. We just sang, come, Jesus, come. We need you right now. That's our only hope. Jesus is the only hope for humanity, beloved. We're not going to be able to fix this. We can't. By definition, we made the mess. We can't fix it. We tried to, 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 to do things our way and, and turn the whole thing into a gum, and now we think that we're going to be able to fix it on our own. Through Jeremiah, God said there is only hope in God. And when we turn back to God, we come to that place in 2 Chronicles 7.14, which most of us know, And if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, oh, we're out. We don't want to do that. We don't want to go to God and say, God, I've made a mess. We don't want to go to God and say, God, you entrusted me with one thing, that was my life, and I've now made it a complete and absolute mess. But that's what it takes. To come to God. My people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Do you see the plan of salvation in that verse, beloved? Do you see the plan of salvation? The Holy Spirit has brought you to the point in your life where you know you can't fix this. And so you come humbly before the only one that can... And you bow your head and you pray. And in that prayer, you are seeking God's face. And once you find God's face and God reveals Himself to you and brings you to salvation, then you can turn from your wicked ways. Then God will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Do you understand what I'm saying, beloved? If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, what I'm about to say is going to sound harsh. Don't bother praying for anybody or anything else because God's not going to hear it. He's not going to hear it. For the unsaved person, the only prayer that God is going to hear is the prayer where they turn their lives over to God. Then He will hear from heaven and forgive your sin and will heal your land. And so listen, beloved, that's why when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I always pray, Lord, if there is unconfessed sin in our lives, then point it out to us right here, right now, so that we can repent of it. And you will forgive it and heal our lives. 
Our scripture tells the well-known story of the potter and the clay. A story that deals with the issue of God's sovereign power and the free will of people. God wants to make us into a vessel for His glory. What's the message of these first ten verses? It is that God has the sovereign right and power to save or condemn who He chooses. I'm going to teach you all a big old fancy word right now. In Calvinism, the most extreme position of Calvinism is known as supralapsarianism. Doggies. That's a big old word. In 1831, this church split over supralapsarianism. Now, they may not have known that was what it was called, but that's what happened. Hyper-Calvinists believe that God created some people in order to save them, and He created some people specifically in order to damn them. That is not what my Bible says. Okay? That's not what I see in my Bible. God did not create some people in order to damn them. Okay? What Jeremiah is saying, and what God is saying to Jeremiah through this Visual representation. Do you notice how God always uses visuals specifically with men? Okay. Because that's how we learn best. It's how we learn best. And so God knows how Jeremiah learns best. And so he says, Jeremiah, I tell you what, I want you to go for a walk this morning. And you know the guy that you buy all your 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 cups and your and, and, and and, and all of your plates and all of that stuff. Why don't you go and watch him? Why don't you go and watch him do it? How many of y'all like those like factory shows on the learning channels that are amazing that show you how they take something that we start with and then it shows it coming out the factory on the other end? And it just fascinates me to see how they take this raw material and produce something. Okay? And it helps me appreciate, number one, the people that are working hard in that factory to produce those things for me. But number two, to have an understanding of the process that that they go through to do that. And so God says to Jeremiah, I want you to go and watch this guy make a pot. Jeremiah had probably never seen somebody make a pot. Okay, I can't even remember the name of the movie where it was a ghost movie where the guy was making a, a pot on the... anyway. And Jeremiah goes, and he's, he's probably going like I would. Well, that's fascinating. Okay? I mean, I've seen some where they're trying to teach children how to make a pot, and they, like, just drag their finger just a little bit in the wrong place, and the whole thing gets off balance, and it's throwing clay all over the room. That's what would happen if I did it. Okay? But he's watching this guy, and he's masterfully using his hands. And he's, he's shaping it into what he wants it to be. And then all of a sudden, we don't know whether there was an impurity in the clay. Probably not, because he reused the same clay. Or if he just kind of dug his hand in just a little bit too hard. And now it's off balance or it doesn't look with, with the pattern that he had in his mind. And so he stops spinning the wheel, and and Jeremiah's watching him. Is he done? And all of a sudden, the guy picks up the the clay that was on the wheel. He just slaps it back down on the wheel again. And Jeremiah's going. And God says, don't I, like the potter, have the right to do the same thing in your life? See, Like God, the potter patiently worked and reworked the clay again and again until he had formed the jar that he wanted. Do you understand, beloved? See, we can speak of our salvation in three verb tenses. And it's true all at the same time. I am saved. 
I came to acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and my Master. And therefore, there was a definitive moment in time in the past where I became saved. Before that time, I was not saved. After that time, I am saved. Here I am some... Well, we won't think about that. How many years ago that was. But here I am some large number of years later. And I am still in the process of being saved. Okay? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, the New Testament tells us. In other words, you know, this is not like... I don't know, your social security card. You get one once, and that's it. You never have to renew it, okay? Unless you lose it. Don't do that. Don't do that. But we work out our salvation by allowing God to continually mold. And listen, my goal, beloved, is that that God will find those imperfections in my life And He'll use His loving hands to just, you know, shape that out of my life as He turns me on His wheel. And then the final tense that we can speak of is at that glorious moment when either Jesus comes back or I close my eyes on this earth and open my eyes looking at Him that I can say, I have been saved. The jar is finished. And He has brought me into His presence to be useful. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 18, (coughs) Paul talks about this thing. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Do you understand, beloved? The treasure that we have is the knowledge of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, listen, God has so much faith in you. God trusts you so much that He allows you to put it in this earthen vessel that is easily shattered. Why does He do that? So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. So that the world can look and say, you know what, that's just oh such and such. I never will forget. Not too long after after God called me to preach. And I'd come down and announce that to Angie and I's home church. And said, God's called me to preach. And my mom was talking to one of my high school teachers. And she said something about Larry announced his call to preach. And Miss Miller looked at her and said, Your son Larry? The Larry that I had in high school? Okay. That's a treasure in an earthly vessel, beloved. So that when the world that used to know me looks at what God is doing with me now, they don't go, oh, Larry found religion and he's cleaned his life up. Larry's done no such thing. Jesus found Larry and cleaned his life up. And has made all of the difference in the world. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Amen? How many of y'all have had an easy ride through life? Never had any problems? Maybe you went through high school and you never had any zits or pimples, especially on the day they were taking the pictures for the yearbook. Isn't that the day that you get like a zitophobia, right? Or zitomania. Or nobody in your life has ever died. You've gotten every job you ever applied for. Everything you ever cooked came out just perfect. No. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Why? Because we have the Lord Jesus in our lives. We are perplexed, but not despairing. How many of y'all go to God every day and say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on in this world. Lord, I don't understand what's going on in my community. Lord, I don't understand what's going on in the church. saw this week another two pastors 
have been arrested for inappropriate contact with people in their congregation. Lord, what's going on with your church? I don't understand what's going on in your church, but Lord, I'm not going to despair. Because I know that you're sovereign. I know that you're in control. That's what God is saying back in Jeremiah 18. He is saying, I am sovereign. I am in control. I'm persecuted. Well, listen, beloved. If the person that you're going to go click the lever for on Tuesday doesn't get elected, that doesn't mean you're persecuted. It means things didn't turn out the way you wanted, but it doesn't mean you're persecuted. I can take you to places in this world where our brothers and sisters are persecuted, where their homes are burned down, where they're arrested and put in jail and then forgotten about. Anyway, persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Do you notice how it's ramping up? Do you notice how what Paul is saying is, is ramping up? That we're afflicted, then we're perplexed, then we're persecuted, and then we're struck down. Do you understand where persecution usually leads? The death of the person being persecuted. What a waste, right? It's not what Paul says. Not destroyed. Not destroyed. I just have a notion. We don't really know how Paul was executed. Most people say that they chopped his head off. I just have a notion that Paul, before they took him uh, to do that, that he, he borrowed a writing instrument and he just kind of drew, drew a line across the back of his neck. And then when he got out to be executed, he looked at the guy and said, Listen, I know what you're about to do, but I want you to know I don't blame you and Jesus loves you so much. Go find somebody that can tell you about Jesus. Because, listen, you're not about to destroy me. Why? Because he is always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's the goal, beloved. That is the goal of our conversion, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. All right. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, some of us literally, literally on this day of prayer for the persecuted church, some of our brothers and sisters are literally being delivered over to death. They will not see the sunset today. But for all of the rest of us, remember what Paul said, and there's a a contemporary song that we sing, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. That means that every day we are constantly delivering over our will. We are constantly delivering over our flesh. So Jesus can put it to death for His sake so that His life is manifested in our mortal flesh. Isn't that our goal, beloved? So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. That's Old Testament. It's in all caps. I believed, therefore I spoke. But that's a call. That's our mission. We believe, therefore we must speak. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Isn't it going to be great, man? I talk about it at every funeral I've ever preached. About how amazing it's going to be when we all join together around the throne of Jesus and we join together and sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb that was slain. Because we know that because God raised Jesus from the dead, He will raise us as well. For all things or for your sake, so that the grace, that's the whole point, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. You know what, beloved? It's not within, well, we want to keep track. 
I mean, I guarantee you tomorrow morning at preachers' meetings all across the world, wow, we had an X number of people in, in church went, 23, come down and get saved. Well, amen, that's great. But in general, you're doing that so that people will think, oh, man, God's really doing a work in your church. Listen, beloved, it's all for the glory of God. That the spreading of the gospel to more and more people may cause the giving. Listen, beloved, the point of somebody getting saved here this morning is not so that I can say, oh, we had a salvation this morning. No, that's not the point. The point is the spreading of thanks to God. That that person that got saved used to not be praising God, used to not be thanking God, but now God is front and center in their lives and they are thanking God for their salvation. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, for some of us more than others, but that's a whole other sermon, Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Amen? I may look like a 65-year-old or maybe a 70-year-old, but that's a whole other thing. But inside here, I'm a young buck. I got the heart of Jesus that's making me just leap and bound. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. Y'all understand all of this is going away, right? How many of y'all, when you, when, when you go to the restaurant and, and they're using a paper napkin, do you, do you like be really careful with it when you're finished with the meal and you fold it and you make sure that you don't put it on the mess in the middle of the plate? You set it off to the side? No. You just put it, it's paper, meaningless. You throw it away. And beloved, everything that you see, everything in this world is temporal. It's meaningless. And our goal ought to be looking at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All right, I'm going to close. Brian's going, I have no idea where this man is in his notes. Jeremiah seems to present a God that is angry. And Warren Wearsby summed it up this way. He said, if Jeremiah seems too angry to us, Perhaps some of us today aren't angry enough at the evil in this world. Thanks to the media, we're exposed to so much violence and sin that we tend to accept it as a normal part of life and want nothing or want to do nothing about it. Oh, beloved, they said, our world says it is hopeless. It is not. If we will turn our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, He will replace our hopelessness with hope. He will make us into the vessel He wants us to be to bring Him the glory and the honor. And so will we place ourselves into His hands.